Well, good morning, everybody. So I was driving over last night to Manhattan, Kansas. So I'm right here this morning. I was thinking a lot about snow and what it means for spring. And the reason I was thinking about it is because I've given several talks up here in the upper Midwest and a lot of the growers talked about how last year's snowpack really helped them get through the extremely dry conditions we had last spring. And so the map we're looking at today to start off with is snow water equivalent through midnight last night, uh, looking at uh, just where it is and how much liquid's in it. And so you can see that while we filled in some of the areas in the Canadian prairie, which this is, this is amazing. I talked to a couple of growers last year that said they raised a corn crop on three inches of rain last year because of how dry it was. So they need this moisture desperately in this area. In fact, the entirety of the Canadian prairie is currently under some form of drought, uh, most of it being under the severe to exceptional uh, category. So to see the snow in place is a very good thing. We can also see that little bit of snow we watched coming over that front yesterday. Now again, this was through midnight or about six hours ago when I'm recording this, but I wanted to show you a year ago. If you take a look at a year ago, not only was the West just completely loaded with snow, one of the best snow years on record. And that's not to say that 2023 into 2024 has been shabby, but uh, much, much more snow a year ago. The other part of it was all of this. And what we have here was coming throughout parts of the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin. We had in some places here, you know, we were approaching anywhere between two and nine inches of liquid in that snow. And New England was in much better shape a year ago. Well, the interior was, especially as you get here on the downwind side of the Great Lakes. So I just keep this into the broader context of where our temperature and precipitation patterns have been and where they're going. And I just come back to maps like this and just see where we have these big holes that need filled in this spring. So in the last 30 days, looking at percent of normal precipitation, some of that snow that's come through this area has helped revive that moisture. Now, remember, when you're double up on your normal precipitation, even in some places tripling up during winter, this is nothing like what a good spring soaking storm system can do. So we just need to make sure we take this um, kind of into context. But I'm thinking about this whole area in through here. This is a large area in the central United States that has just been missing these bigger storm systems as of late. We've had some that have curled up into Canada, some that have stayed south and developed up the East Coast, and we've left this kind of large area in the void of getting good moisture. In fact, there are parts of the state I'm in today where we're down here in the zero to 10% over the last 30 days. So I guess the context that we're kind of rolling with here is when do we start to deliver? When can we get a nice slow moving trough that sneaks either through here or comes out of Colorado and goes towards Chicago, finishes in New England, or one that, like I said, just curls up the coast? We need a slow moving cutoff flow. And you say, why slow? Well, when we get them to slow down and they form along the front range or out into the plains here, the slower they are, the better the chances are, the better the opportunities of drawing that Gulf moisture back to the west, right? We've covered that a few times. So if we can cut off a low, that's the best case scenario for this area. But as it stands, this is where we are with, with moisture. Okay, last 72 hours, just the past three days here, we've had some very, very heavy rainfall across parts of the south and southeast, specifically here in the southeast. And that slow moving low earlier in the week, it kind of started life just south, <clears throat> excuse me, of Cape Hatteras, kind of rolled through New England, given a really good drink of, of, of rain here. So the eastern Corn Belt has been picking up moisture. The south and southeast, the Appalachian Mountains, better chances at getting some moisture. But some of this was quite heavy the last couple of days. And just to show you, we still have flood watches out for parts of Alabama uh, and Georgia. But the next system that's coming out today, right here, it's got winter storm warnings in parts of Nebraska and uh, into Colorado. And as this system kind of emerges, it's not only gonna be producing the risks of severe weather, but also a good chance at a good soaking rain that's gonna move right through this section of the country. So let's go ahead and have a look at it. This is just as the sun was rising this morning. So here's one system leaving and here's the next one coming in. If I take you back to yesterday, we had very dense fog in places. You can see some of the snow that fell underneath the cloud cover up here. And I'm waiting on the west to clear out just enough where I can get a good look at how much snow we've got out there. But it's being fed, this next system is being fed by this branch of the subtropical jet stream and a low right here coming through California yesterday that's going to help. It's going to be our kicker low on the back side of the new one that's developing right here in the central U.S. Now, as I mentioned, that low is not closed and cut off. You see, when we look at the overall flow, what I want to see is a closed circulation, something in sitting and spinning like this one here. Okay, see how it's closed up? And therefore, it's going to be a much slower mover as it comes out of this part of Canada toward uh, Hudson Bay and eventually on off to the east. 
but we've got at least two th systems to watch. One that's coming through right here. This is gonna give us a three day severe weather threat kind of in these three areas over the next three days and better rains to the north. And then we got this next one that's gonna be coming into the Pacific Northwest. Now after this, after this, we lose our split. Remember I was talking a lot about that last week, that split in the jet stream? That's gonna be gone. And we're gonna usher in a whole new pattern for the middle and end of this month of March. It's gonna take a little while to get here, but we're gonna put a whole new pattern into place. It's gonna start with what will look like an omega block in the west. So let's get to that in a second here. First of all, I just wanna let you know that early this morning, we do have some active thunderstorms. Just looking, uh, this is about six o'clock in the morning at uh, where our lightning strikes are, <clears throat> excuse me. You can see, um, again, through Kansas, Oklahoma, getting down into Texas, Arkansas, Missis or Missouri, forgive me. We've got some uh, good storms rolling this morning, and I'm, I'm hoping we can get some of them. Here, I'd love to see some lightning and thunder this morning and get the associated moisture with these storms. So we're going to kind of watch for that. So today, where's our severe weather risk? Again, stretching in part of the Southern Plains. So the National Weather Service has been pretty clear on this for the last three days as being the risk area for today. As we get into tomorrow, the 8th, uh, by the way, that's going to be my uh, that's my mother-in-law's 70th birthday. I need to get on that. Um, goodness. Okay. No, wait. No, it's not her birthday. It's my brother-in-law's birthday. My mother-in-law's birthday is at the end of the month. <laughs> so sorry. I didn't get much sleep last night, so I'm thinking about other things. Anyway, storms down here uh, uh, um, on the 8th, and then as we get into the 9th, it's going to translate into the southeast. I'm sorry about that. All right. Let's come back to it and uh, and see what's causing all of this upper level atmospheric flow. Now watch. Remember how I just went on about closed lows? So here is the first. There's the one that's up north that's slow, right? So as we play this forward through the rest of today into tomorrow, that broader low still sweeps across the south, but it doesn't amplify and close off till it gets into New England. So you watch this thing slow down. Watch it'll slow down as it gets here. Behind it, here comes the next wave into the Pacific Northwest. We get a brief warm up in the middle part of the country and then we're gonna get into this pattern, ready? Now watch. What happened to our split? Gone, gone by the 13th. And therefore we start to develop what appears to be a highly amplified omega block right here. Well, gotta be careful calling it a block. A block technically has to last at least 10 days. But when you start to see the flow getting this amplified, I mean, you take a look at this, how it's stacked up over here, we're gonna slow things down a bit. So what this is going to do is by mid-month drop a low right here, and this is the one I'm excited about. I'm excited about it because upstream is, again, a highly amplified, almost pinched off ridge. So you're saying, what does that mean? Well, that means we have more north-south flow than west-to-east flow. So that means this low, this second one out here, is going to be slower. And if it's slower, look at that. that that's 13, 14, 15, 16. It's just hanging out down there in the four corner states, getting into Mexico and Texas, if we can leave it around there long enough, it might be able to increase precipitation chances to fill in that part of that hole I mentioned a few moments ago. But what then happens after this is that the pattern wants to go away from the split, which pushes a ridge up the west coast into Alaska. There's ridging that's happening over Greenland. And the net effect is we're changing the dynamics of the Arctic we're putting higher pressure, bigger ridges there. So what happens? Cold has to go somewhere. It's going to go in three spots. And one of those spots is the eastern half of North America. So this is the cool down we've been talking about possibly coming here mid to end of March. So now the short range models are picking up on it, not just the European weeklies. And I've got questions as to how long this sticks around. And I'll, I'll make another point about that in just a few seconds. But just remember something. When this flow comes in like this, this goes over drier for this area, drier for the west. And our wettest location will likely be down here across the south. And I couldn't be happier to get moisture into Texas with this pattern. We, we've got to get moisture into Texas. I'm, this is my area of greatest concern going into summer. I told you about it yesterday with the risk of, of, of major ridging events. And so I want to load them up with as much moisture as possible at this time of year. Okay, all that being said, let's take a look at our high-res models. This is this morning, pretty good initialization. Again, you saw where I was pointing out those thunderstorms. Watch the backside, though. Quick here in parts of Colorado, Nebraska, even Kansas, getting over into some snow, including South Dakota and Wyoming as the storms progress east. So tonight, we're going to keep an eye on a couple of different areas, one here and one here for the risk of strong to severe storms. Snow on the backside. 
but this is going to be bringing rain into Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, all in that hole of where there's not been much moisture. And we need this. We need it to go nice and slow right through there. This is through Friday, getting into Friday midday. Look at this good soaker coming into this part of the country. Need it. Backside, snow, Kansas, panhandles, possible. Severe storms to the south on Friday. This is where we're going to watch out for those all the way from the south to the mid-south. And then this system curls its way up through the Ohio Valley, drops a front right in through here, and gives us the risk of severe storms as we get into the day on Saturday in this region. So I, I love everything about this system. It's slower, but it's not slow. I need it to slow down more than this. Meanwhile, the next frontal boundary comes into the Pacific Northwest. We're going to keep an eye on that one. So what are we getting out of this? Well, the WPC updated their uh, precipitation forecast based on 12Z data. So this is a seven-day outlook. And I just want to remind you that I put a hard contour at one and a half inches. See that right there? So this is very much needed. It's needed farther to the west, of course, but all of this coming into this area, that's that big hole. So to fill that in with a good chance of an inch to an inch and a half of rain is great. We don't need it as much down here. We've had flooding down here. So we're just saying that the flood risk continues and the possibility of grabbing over two inches in this area is relatively high. And the next system that comes into the Pacific Northwest, it's primarily a coastal precipitation maker, but uh, you can kind of see what we're looking at there. The hole is still here and it's here. And those are a couple of places that are gonna be difficult to fill in given the pattern of where it's going. But I wanna take you straight to a probability map to show you that over the next 10 days, the models have increased in this area, the chances of getting an inch. We're now in this 50 to 90% range here. Very heavy rains to the south and part of the east coast and of course along the west, but we'll come back and look at those probability maps in a second. Okay, let's get into our model comparison. GFS left, European right. As I play it forward, there's that same system. This is through Friday night, getting into early Saturday morning, Saturday midday, Saturday evening, and we're finally getting some answers as we go into the early morning hours on Sunday as to what this snow could look like. And as that system rolls through, I think the snow totals have come down over what I was thinking about earlier this week. But watch how the low just curls up there later this week. It's, it's gonna be there from Saturday through Monday. That's the slowdown we were watching as the low kind of closes itself off. On the back side, though, we could expect to get a little bit of lake effect snow and also some snow into the interior of New England, but I don't think we're going to get much more than that. Now, in the meantime, starting this weekend, the next system comes into the northwest, and does it make it out into the plains? It really doesn't do that as well as the previous system do does because we're going to watch this low cut itself off down here as a ridge builds in behind it. So take a look at this. This is next Tuesday getting into Wednesday. There it is. So now this is the low I've got a lot of hope for. And what I'm hoping is that that one comes through and just hits this whole area with the moisture that it's showing right now. Parts of Iowa and, and South Dakota, Nebraska, Colorado. And then after that, how does it slide east? That is a low that I think we have some potential and it's the mid-month low that we gotta keep a close eye on, okay? So let's go ahead and add it all up. European model first, let's blow that up once. And let's just go out there seven days. And that is a seven day forecast right there. Let's compare it to the Euro, or so, sorry, to the GFS. So there's the GFS, here's the European. I like it. They're both giving similar, you know, still good agreement. Um, next, though, I want to show you a 240 hour forecast from their AI system. And right in through here, we've now seen the models really pick up on precipitation totals. So let's do this. Let's take this map, which I know is in a different projection. I, when I get home off of this trip, or off of the next couple of trips, I'm gonna to start to get these all in a common projection scheme for you. That's 240 hours for the GFS. Here it is for the Euro. So ready, and I know they're not lined up, but this is the European 10 day. That's the GFS 10 day. And I'm really honestly looking right in through here. That's my focal point with this forecast. And then here is the new update. And I just think a lot about this area because I get a lot of comments from viewers that are in these states saying, we've got to see this deliver. Now, can we really get two inches here? I got a guy that comments, I don't know his name, his username isn't clear to me, but he's been telling me that in his part of Kansas, it's been, I think, well over 700 days since he's had two inches of rain. Hey man, I'm pulling for you on this, trying to show you what it takes to get it there. So I just want you to be aware that we might possibly get there in the next 10 days. May not be all coming in one day, but there is moisture coming to an area that critically needs it. 
okay? I do have a bit of optimism in my voice because of the pace of these lows, but um, even if we get half of this, it's good rain. Okay, uh, on from there, let's go to the snow side of it and check out the European model first. So now if we get out there a week, we can see this area picking up a good four to eight inches. That's possible, better snows in the Rockies. Sierra Nevada and Cascades with that next low that comes in have a better chance. And then as you notice here, into the interior of New England, that's where we see our best chances of snow. And the GFS is kind of coming into alignment with that. So again, European and GFS. But I wanna come back to the probability maps and let's go to the dry side of this next. So you saw where we were really wet a moment ago. This now becomes the area that we continue to focus in on because the current pattern doesn't help it. And then later when the omega a blocky pattern shows up here in the west, that northwest flowing through here doesn't help it either. So I'll keep an eye on this region to see if we can return better moisture. But what has shrunk is this area right here. Again, this is the probability it's staying under a tenth of an inch over the next 10 days. Okay, from here, just a reminder, here is that setup. This is out there Friday the 15th. And then you're gonna notice that out there in the 17th, 18th, and 19th, we have a complete reversal over the pattern since the end of February. And that is now ridging west, troughing east. And so we have questions as to the longevity of this. The long range European's been hinting that it could be here for the end of March and then last into the first week of April, you know, something like this. And I do think that's a possibility. It's certainly there all the way to the end of the current European model run. But we wanna know what that's gonna do to both temperature and precip. So on the week two forecast, that'd be the 14th to the 20th, which will get us out there almost to the equinox. Drier west, drier west, drier west. That's a telltale sign of a big ridge. The wettest will be along the Gulf Coast from Texas all the way to South Carolina. And that'll just be at the base of that trough. That makes a lot of sense dynamically with this pattern. All right, here's the other side of that story. This is where we have frost risk over the next seven days. And if you look at the high temperatures and how they change, this is what I'm expecting. Thursday's highs getting into Sat or Friday, excuse me. So there's the cold air coming out behind that low, supporting the risk of snow. As we then go into Saturday and Sunday, look, there's gonna be a really good cold air damming event, we think right here along the uh, Appalachian Mountains and Blue Ridge Mountains. We have one more good surge of warmth. This is uh, Sunday and a Monday coming into the Northern Plains, Upper Midwest, Western Corn Belt, and that's around on Tuesday into Wednesday. But remember, it's after this 13th, it's the 15th, 16th, 17th, that the omega block sets up, the west starts to trend warmer, and we lose this. Ready? So this is day 5 through 10. Here's day 10 through 15. So this will be the point when that ridge is up and the trough is here. Now, one question I've had is about, again, the duration of that colder air. And I want to show you something that's also happening at this time. It appears that as we play out there toward the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th, that the stratospheric polar vortex may be aligning itself over the top of the tropospheric polar vortex. Now we gotta be careful. It's late March when this is happening. This is not like what could happen if this occurred in January or February. So we see the linking up between these two events and that just makes me pause for a moment and ask, do we keep that cooler air around for a while? Because the European weeklies have been showing it, right? So for example, that's out there the week ending the 27th of March. This is the week ending, well, this is the week following Easter. We still see the cooler risks in this area and some cooler air in the mountains. There's likely a lot of feedback with the snow here. That's why we tend to see this. So I think that as we plan to early April, we're gonna to have to get past that first week of April before I think we see more wide open planting windows begin to show up in the Midwest of the United States and to kind of shake off the risk of getting some colder air down here into the South. I think that'll be the last week of March that we have to worry about that, but the first week of April, we'll still be spending time recovering with some warmer conditions. Now, you know the big thing that I've been worried about kind of connecting all of this has been the MJO. And I'm just gonna give you that story one more time. The sooner we can get the MJO to come right back over to phases five and four, the, the sooner the cold air is out. That's at least the tropical side of this. If the MJO though sweeps all the way back into the Western Pacific and maybe does a reset, then we have a different scenario. We're colder east longer. Right now the ensemble average continues to drop it into null space, meaning that the predictability here is not what I'd want. And this also has a major impact on South American weather. So if you look at this phase diagram, I want you to compare eight and one to five and four. And we're gonna do that both sides of this diagram to show you why that's critical for South American weather. If we are in phase four and five, 
all of the convection is over phase four and five, which are right here, four and five, okay? That's where those numbers are, four, five, four, five. When that occurs, we tend to get sinking motion over the Cerrado, which is in Brazil, and even over the Amazon, right? So this is where we are today. This is where it is today. Now, if we move to phase eight and one, there's now sinking motion here and rising motion there. And we got a lot of Brazilian growers that desperately need the MJO to go to phase A1 because they need a good drink on this Safrina crop. And the model right now is giving us no good information. The spread is huge. Some of the ensemble members here, some of them there. So I'll be honest, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm having a difficult time figuring out where this MJO is gonna go. And I told you before, 40% of the time that it is predicted to come all the way over here, it fails. That's just from some past research. So I have to, I just have to think about that research paper and what it might mean for the failure of the MGO to get here, which would say we go back to phase four and five and start to run the risk of being drier. So right now what's going on in South America is that we expect over the next 10 days, if you take a look, the heat's gonna come up. And during that time frame, we're still influenced by phase four or five, which is wet in Argentina, wet along the Paraná River, but drier than average as you come across Brazil's center west growing area. And even now, gripping a bit more towards Tocantins and even over here toward Bahia uh, as well. So it's not just Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sol. But here's the trick. These longer range models, while they give us that signal through most of March, if the MJO sweeps over, which some of the ensemble members are predicting, it's giving us this look through mid to late April. And what I'm, I'm just gonna make the statement again, this right here is the big question mark. I think there are, the, or there at least is the potential that if the MJO fails to make that progression that this area goes drier. And if it does, we'll start to see some sort of story coming out of Brazil on a Safrina corn crop. Now, Argentina, I'm not worried about. Southern Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, even though it's a little hot right now, I think we're gonna probably get these rains back in, especially if this goes drier. But I'll be watching that, that'll be top of mind. And to be honest, the signal is gonna come from Australia. So I was just talking with the Australians last night, and um, you know we were having a discussion here about the flow that's right now set up. There's a large area of high pressure that's gonna live here and just slowly slide toward New Zealand and all around it. The flow is coming off the tropics. That's because the MJO is right now living in phase four or five. So by the way, if it comes back here, this stays wet and this area stays dry. Real quick before I transition away from this, um, much of Western Europe is wet. We've seen some wetter signals around the Black Sea as well. All the heavy precipitation over Pakistan has begun to back off too. So I'll leave you there with this map as kind of a last one to take a look at today and we'll catch up again tomorrow morning. Thanks.